Okay, the quiz. So the quiz is now officially too late to submit. So I can go over it now. <clears throat> a quick word I want to mention about quizzes in general. Um, some of you may have noticed that uh, if you submit the quiz early, there's a chance, I'm not guaranteeing that I'll do it, but, but there's a chance if you submit it early, like on that particular Friday, that I can have a chance to uh, look it over and say, okay, fix this and fix that. And you might have a chance to resubmit it, right? But if you, some of you just submitted it like 10 minutes ago, then obviously I don't have a chance to do that. Okay, so I'm not promising I can do that for everybody, but quite often when you submit the quiz, <clears throat> if I happen to be online right at that moment, I can get it to you right away. But if not, usually within the day. So let's say if you submit it even on Friday, I can usually get to it by Saturday, or if you submit it Saturday, I can get to it by Sunday or something like that. And if there's something that isn't quite right, I have a chance to say, oh, try this and try that. And then you can resubmit it for uh, more credit. Okay, so that's an advantage of submitting the quiz early. Some of you just submitted it, in, like I said, 15 minutes ago, uh, then obviously I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So um, I won't have the opportunity to do that. So that's one thing you can keep in mind for submission of quizzes. Obviously, I don't want you to rush and you know, just do a half-hearted job and just throw anything together. You, know, you should try your best. And getting it right. The other thing I want to say about quizzes is I'm usually more forgiving on quizzes than formal exams. Quizzes, I try to make them, you know, as low pressure as possible, and I'm more willing to forgive stuff, but I'm not as willing to forgive stuff on the major exams. Okay, so an example is we go over the quiz right now, and I'll talk about some of this. Okay, so factor x plus one, x minus one, x plus two, x minus two. Okay, the intercept should be zero comma one fourth. Put a zero here, 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 and here. Or it might even be easier to look at plugging in zero at the original, right? Put a zero right there and right there, you get negative one divided by negative four, which is one fourth. And you can tell plus or minus one comma zero, those are the intercepts. <clears throat> okay, vertical asymptotes, as I mentioned before, uh, vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes, those are the equations of lines, they are lines. So vertical lines have equation x equals a constant. Horizontal lines have equation y equals a constant. Okay, so you can't leave it just as plus or minus two or one. You need to say x equals negative two or x equals positive two and y equals one. Okay, so I mentioned I may have forgiven that on this particular quiz, but I might not be as forgiving on the exam. Okay, you have to put x equals y equals whatever. And I have, I have a little memory trick again: vax v a x and hey h a y. You have to put that whole thing, so to speak. Okay, to get y equals one, it was basically x squared over x squared. I showed you that trick that uh, you can just cover up everything besides the first term and see x squared over x squared is one. But you're not supposed to just say horizontal asymptote is one. Again, you need to say y equals one. Okay, uh, it's an even function because if you replace x by negative x, you get the same as the original function. So it's an even function, which means you have y axis symmetry, symmetry with respect to the y axis, as you can see right over here. Okay, then I needed to see some analysis, something like this. Okay, what happens if I approach negative two from the left and from the right? And what happens when I approach positive two from the left and from the right? Okay, so you'll be plugging in something like negative 2.01, negative 1.99, positive 1.99, 2.01. Okay, so what you do is you plug into here and you just have to give me the sign. It's way easier than coming up with the exact value. That's a big waste of time. So you plug in negative 2.01 here, 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 and here. There are all four negatives, so that gives you a positive. So that means y approaches infinity. When you approach an asymptote, you're either going to go to infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so you just want to determine is it positive or negative. So in this side, it goes like that. Negative 1.99 here, 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 and here. They're all negative except this one is positive, right? Negative 1.99 plus two comes out to be a positive quantity. So that gives me three negatives. Three negatives leaves me with a negative. So as I approach negative two from the right, it drops down like that. Okay, we know it touches negative one, zero, goes to zero comma one, four, one, zero. <clears throat> okay, positive 1.99, you have three positives and one negative. The only one that's negative is that one. That's gonna be positive, that's gonna be positive, that's gonna be positive, but there's only one negative. So there's one negative mean negative. So as I approach two from the left side, it again drops to negative infinity. And when I plug in a number slightly bigger than two, like 2.01, they're all positive. 
positive, 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 positive. Four positives makes it positive. So y approaches positive infinity. Okay. And we're to know when x approaches either infinity or negative infinity. Okay. Back to here. When x is super big positive or super big negative, you ignore this stuff. It's basically a ratio of one. So it goes like that and like that. Okay. So that's the graph and that is the quiz. All right, so a reminder again for quizzes, if you submit a quiz early enough, quote unquote, I, I don't make this a promise, but if I can, if you submit it, let's say by Friday, I usually try to get it by Saturday. If you submit it by Saturday, I usually get to it by Sunday. Uh, and then if something isn't right, I'll tell you, oh, try to fix this or whatever. And then you might have a chance to resubmit it. Okay, but some of you just submitted it, like I said, Monday morning at 8.50. I don't have time to look at it by then. So you just have to go with um, whatever happens. So it's considered on time, but um, I don't have a chance to give you a second chance, so to speak. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's that for quizzes. Again, I grade quizzes much more leniently than I would exams, right? So for the exam on Friday, I may not be as lenient, say on stuff like this, right? Like um, if you didn't put the X equals or Y equals, I might take off for that again, all right? All right, and speaking of the exam, so we have our next exam coming up. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of material, I'm already at 3.6, so I have this whole week to do 3.6. I think I will finish pretty adequately by Wednesday. So again, Thursday, Thursday question and answer, Friday will be the exam. Um, I may be able to start sneaking in a little bit of chapter four. Uh, again, chapter four looks like our longest chapter. If you want to know what chapter four is about, it's trig. Okay, so we're reviewing trigonometry, mostly uh, all of this. So that's why it's a long list. And then chapter five and chapter six aren't that long at all. So it'll be quite a while until we take the next exam for chapter four. Okay, but looking at the schedule, we are here. So, and we had a couple of buffer days. Again, buffer day doesn't mean the holiday, keep coming, or I might start going on to the next section in case I fall behind, I get sick or whatnot. <clears throat> okay, but our third exam is this coming Friday. And you've already had two exams, so you know the rules. Uh, you got to submit the homework. Uh, you have to have at least 70% of the homework done. Uh, but you can submit it early. Um, and just like before, uh, maybe 901, 902, I'll send you a Canvas announcement for the exam so you can look over there. But I'll try to project it also um, for those of you who prefer that. Uh, you have until what, our usual ending time at 10 o'clock. So then you take a picture on your cell phone, click, 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 click. And you have five minutes to do that. So you have until 10.05 to submit the exam. And then you st still have until 10.30 to submit the homework. But if you want to turn in the homework earlier, you're allowed to do that. Okay, and just looking ahead here, yeah, the chapter four exam isn't for a while. So we have one, two, three, four weeks, um, November the 6th for the chapter four test. But uh, the last two chapters aren't that long. So looks like that'll be much faster. So exam five and then exam six. Okay, so that's where we're at. Okay, so I'll lecture on 3.6 today, tomorrow, Maybe I'll finish tomorrow, um, but if not, I have still Wednesday. Okay. So 3.6, we're doing complex numbers again. And uh, the assignment was one to 55 odd. As of now, no changes. Yeah, I think we're good. And here are the problems again, for those of you that need it. And some more over here. Okay. Okay, so we did very little last time. We'll do a lot more. So main idea right now is we have the complex number, imaginary number i. i is defined to be the square root of negative one or i squared is equal to negative one. Okay, we have something called a complex number. A complex number looks like a plus bi. a is considered the real part. bi is the imaginary part. Okay, so like three minus five i, that whole thing is called a complex number. Okay. It's got a real part, three, and it's got an imaginary part, negative five i, right? So the whole combination is called a complex number. All right, so I did some problems last time. We'll do many more, okay? So let me start with problem number nine. Six plus five i times negative three minus two i, okay? So notice this is standard form, and this is standard form. <clears throat> now, at the beginning, you just work it out like FOIL. Regular FOIL, and then the only thing you watch out for at the end is you're not supposed to leave an answer as i squared. 
Because anytime you see I squared, you change it to negative one. All right. So here we go, regular FOIL. Six times negative three, negative 18. Six times negative two I, negative 12 I. Five I times negative three, negative 15 I. Five I times negative two I, negative 10 I squared. Okay, so that seemed pretty quote unquote normal. And then the new stuff is anytime you see I squared, you change it to negative one. So this is like negative 10 times negative one. So I change it to negative 18. And this is what negative 27 I plus 10. It's negative 10 times a negative one. And then just combine the real parts and that leaves me with negative eight. So final answer is negative eight minus 27. Uh, okay, so for these complex numbers, you never leave your answer with I squared or I cubed and whatnot because we know how to break it down by means of doing stuff like this. Okay. And again, if you want to put all this stuff on your cheat sheet, you may. That's certainly about. <clears throat> all right, uh, number 11 <clears throat> 2 minus 3i times 2 plus 3i. Okay, these are called conjugates complex conjugates I mentioned over there. The conjugate of A plus BI is A minus BI. Okay, you change the sign of the imaginary part, but you don't change the sign of the real part. Okay, so leave the real part alone, two and two, but negative three I, positive three I. These are called complex conjugates. Okay, so this looks like A minus B, A plus B. Shortcut is A squared minus B squared. So I go two squared, four, minus b squared, so 3i times itself is 9i squared. And there's that i squared again. So anytime you see i squared, make it negative one. So it's like negative nine times negative one. So that becomes four plus nine or 13. Okay. And notice the answer turns out to be real. Okay, that always happens in the book mentioned this also. So if you ever multiply a complex number by its conjugate, a plus bi times a minus bi, you get a squared minus b squared i squared, right? bi times bi is b squared i squared. But again, i squared is equal to negative one. So it's negative b squared times negative one, which is a squared plus b squared. And that comes out to be real. Okay, so the final result to mention there is if we multiply a complex number with its conjugate, we get a real number. So anytime you do this business of a plus bi times a minus bi, like four minus three i times four plus three i, you just change the sign of the imaginary part, you always end up with a real number. Okay, we're gonna need that a little bit later. Okay, problem 17, i to the 104th power. Okay, if you stop and think about it, i to the 104th is on this table that I showed you last time. Okay, zero, four, eight, 12, 16, 104 will end up on this list. Okay. One way to think about it is if you divide those numbers by four, there's no remainder. Okay. Zero divided by four is zero, no remainder. Four divided by four is one, no remainder. Eight divided by four is two, no remainder. 12 divided by four is three, no remainder. Okay. So all of these numbers divide by four evenly. There's no remainder. So 104 divided by four turns out to be 26 evenly. So it puts the category of i to the zero, which is also one. Okay, so that's one way you can think about something like that when you give you a big number, okay? All of these look like there's a remainder of one if you divide by four. All of these, if you divide by four, remainder is two. All of these, if you divide by four, the remainder is three. Okay, is it worth memorizing? I don't think so. Okay, but another way you can think of this is since I know i to the fourth is already one, you can think of this as the following. Okay, so we said 104 divided by four is 26. In other words, four times 26 is 104. So this is the same as this, right? And I now know that I to the fourth is equal to one. So it's basically one to the 26. 
and one of the 26 that turns out to be one. Okay. All right, so that's that. Now we have some problems which look like you have square roots of negatives. Okay, before we said stop, can't do it, not real. We're still going to say not real, but we can do it with these so called complex numbers. All right, so how do you do the square root of negative nine? Okay, so first I'll do it more analytically, but then I'll talk about the shortcut. Okay, so negative nine, I can think of it as negative one times nine, right? Negative one times nine is negative nine. And then I see the square root of negative one. And then I say to myself, oh yeah, the square root of negative one is I. So this comes outside as an I. So I have I times the square root of nine. The square root of nine is three, so three I. Right? That logic works no matter what number is inside. It could be negative 10, negative 20, negative 17, negative a million, whatever. So the shortcut will be to go straight from here to here. So in other words, you don't have to do this intermediate step anymore. Okay. So the trick is anytime you see that negative under the square root, just immediately bring it outside as an I like that. Okay. So you can go straight from this step to this step. You should say, oh yeah, that's going to be an I, I outside and square root of nine. Okay. I'm going to do that trick over here. <clears throat> okay. So for 21, two plus radical negative five times one plus square root of negative one, okay? Well, square root of negative one is already I by definition way over here. I is the square root of negative one. And now how do I do the square root of negative five? Just take that minus sign and make it come stand outside here as two plus I radical five. Okay. So that's a shortcut that I'm showing you now. You don't have to do this intermediate step. Just go right to here. And now it just looks like a foil. Okay, so first outer inner last, just as before, right? Okay, so first two times one is two. Outer two times I is two I. Inner <coughs> I root five times one is I root five. And last I root five times an I, I got an I squared times radical five. And once again, anytime you get an I squared, I squared changes to negative one, okay? And now how do I write my answer? Even though there's square roots all over the place, you put the real part first and then the imaginary part. So real means it doesn't have any I. So that doesn't have an I. That doesn't have an I after I take care of the I squared. So these two come together as two minus radical five. That's considered the real part. And then let's see. These two both have an I, right? So I factor out the I and write it as two plus radical five I. So this is my final answer. This is considered the real part. This is the imaginary part. It looks like A plus B I. Two minus radical five, that whole thing is my A. And this whole thing is my B, two plus radical five times I. Okay. And here's one more like that, 23. Square root of negative 16 over nine. Square root of negative 16 over nine. So immediately take that minus sign outside, make it stand up as an I. It's almost like take this thing and turn it 90 degrees so it stands up as an I. And square root of 16 over nine. And the square root of 16 over nine is four thirds. Square root of 16 is four, square root of nine is three. So just four thirds I. And there we go. All right, then the next issue is how do you do division with complex numbers? And that's where we have to worry about this complex conjugate stuff. Okay, so I'll show you a couple of those. Simplify one over one plus I. All right, so to rationalize the denominator, make a nice denominator, we multiply the top and the bottom by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Okay, so the conjugate of a plus bi is a minus bi and vice versa. So what is the conjugate of one minus i? One plus i. So you multiply the numerator and the denominator by one plus i. One plus i over one plus
plus i. So now it looks like a minus b times a plus b. Okay, so top one times that is just one plus i. And now the bottom is just a squared minus b squared, right? The difference of two squares. One times one is one. i times i is i squared. So it's one minus i squared. But again, it's one minus a negative one. So it's one plus one. Two. So I have one plus i <coughs> divided by two. Okay. The last little detail is you're not supposed to leave it like that. You're supposed to write it in the form of a plus bi. So what did I draw over here? It's just showing you that you split it up. Take that two and split it into one half plus one half i, or i over two is the same as one half i. So it looks like a real part and an imaginary part, right? A plus, oops, a plus bi like that, a plus bi. Okay, so one more time, to clean up one over one minus i, multiply by one plus i over one plus i, the conjugate of the denominator. Okay, now if this was a plus, you would make this one a minus. Okay, and 29 is a perfect example of that. Okay, so 29. The original problem looks like that. <clears throat> one minus four i divided by one plus four i. Okay, and at the beginning, don't even look at the numerator. Okay, so multiply the numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So what's the conjugate of one plus four i? one minus four i okay and yes it happens to be the same thing as the top but you should not concern yourself with that so don't say hey coincidentally it turns out to be the same as the top and maybe the author intentionally did that just to you know see if you knew what to do okay but it doesn't matter that it's the same thing you multiply by the conjugate of the denominator one minus four i over one minus four i who cares that it turns out to be the same as this just go with it okay so now the denominator looks like a plus b a minus b, which again is a squared minus b squared. So one squared is one minus 16i squared, right? Four times four is 16, i times i is i squared. And there's that i squared again, i squared becomes negative one. So it's like negative 16 times negative one. So it's one plus 16, which is 17. So there it is, I got a nice denominator. And just multiply out the top. <clears throat> it's one minus four i minus another four i is minus eight i plus sixteen i squared. And there's that i squared again. So plus sixteen i squared is negative sixteen. It's sixteen times negative one. So I have one minus sixteen, which is negative fifteen. Okay. Again, the convention is to put the real part first. Negative fifteen minus eight i divided by 17. Okay, and again, that's sort of the answer, except we're supposed to write our answer in the form of a plus bi. So again, just split the 17 into two. Put the 17 under that and under that. So this is the final answer. Negative 15 over 17 minus 8 over 17i. And we are done with that one. All right, then uh, we're going to do some of these. Find these zeros of the quadratic function and write the function in factored form. Okay, no doubt a lot of these will have complex solutions. So we'll see what we can do with that. Okay. <clears throat> now, if it's x squared, we can certainly use a quadratic formula. All right. So let's take a look at some of these. Okay, 31. f of x equals x squared plus 4, and it said to find the zero, so I set it equal to zero. Okay, now, you can use the quadratic formula if you wanted to, but I'll uh, make it easier. I'll use the square root property instead. If I subtract 4, it says x squared equals negative 4. And yes, for real numbers, you might have said before, oh, you can't do it. Stop. Not a real number. We're still going to say not a real number, but now we can keep going with complex numbers. So x squared equals negative 4. Take the square root of both sides. 
include a plus or minus. So x is plus or minus the square root of negative four, take out the negative as an i, so plus or minus i root four. And of course, the square root of four is two i. So plus or minus two i. So our two solutions are x equals negative two i, x equals positive two i. Okay, so how do I write that factor? Okay, well, if you stop and think about it, suppose the solutions were, you know, three and five, you would go x minus three, x minus five, right? And maybe I can illustrate that through a little bit of scratch paper here. Okay, so suppose we had here, um, x equals three, x equals five. You would say the polynomial could be x minus three, x minus five equals zero, right? Or x equals negative two, x equals negative four. Then you would go x minus a minus two or x plus two, x plus four equals zero, right? To have it in factor form. Well, you do the same thing no matter how complicated you get. Okay, so even though I have i's there, you still do the same thing. You still go x minus that, x minus that. So f of x is x minus a minus 2i or x plus 2i, and this is x minus 2i. So now this is completely factored. Okay, so we have a second degree equation. We're going to factor it, even if we get complex numbers, there are going to be two factors. Okay, and there they are x plus 2i x minus two i. I mean, normally you wouldn't think of this as factoring, but it counts as factorization, right? <clears throat> if you multiply this back out, you do get this. Okay, you can check it. X squared minus four i squared minus four i squared is negative four times negative one. Those come to be plus four. Okay, so it actually works. All right, uh, 35, and maybe this is the last one I was going to do. Okay, so we have plenty of time. So after I do 35, I'll stop, let you ask any questions, and if you don't have any questions, we're done. <clears throat> okay, 2x squared minus x plus 2. So again, it asks for the zeros of the function. Okay, so it starts off with 2x squared minus x plus 2. You can use the quadratic formula. It doesn't factor. Okay, now, how do you know it doesn't factor? You can try it doesn't work. But remember, you can always use a quadratic formula. So the quadratic formula works factor or no factor. So we'll just go right to it. So a is 2, b is negative 1, c is 2. Throw it in. So x is equal to negative b, positive 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, negative 1 squared is 1, <coughs> minus 4 times a times c. 4 times 2 times 2, all over 2a, 2 times 2. 4 times 2 times 2 comes out to be 16. So it's 1 minus 16. Aha, that's a negative. So 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 15, all over 4. So I'm going to have two complex solutions. Right? So 1 plus or minus i radical 15, all over 4. And if I break that into 2, 1 fourth plus or minus i root 15 over 4. Let's break it up even more. Okay, so my two solutions are x equals 1 fourth minus radical 15 over 4i and 1 fourth plus radical 15 over 4i. Notice these solutions are complex conjugates. Okay, that always happens with these polynomials if you have integer coefficients. Okay. If you have any complex solutions, they always come in pairs, complex conjugate pairs. Okay, so let me try to show you that principle. It's called conjugate pairs it's on page 183. Suppose the coefficients of a polynomial, P of X is blah, blah, blah. If you have real number of conjugates, and z is a complex zero of p with multiplicity m, then its complex conjugate is also a zero of p with multiplicity m. Right now, we don't have to worry about the multiplicity, but just remember that uh, complex numbers come in conjugate pairs. 
So if A plus BI is a zero of a polynomial, then so is A minus BI automatically. Okay, so let's say you get three minus four I, you're automatically gonna get three plus four I. And you can see from the quadratic formula why that works, right? When you're using the quadratic formula, right? <clears throat> Once you get the square root of a negative, that plus or minus already gives you the conjugate pair, right? Because you're gonna have blah, 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 minus whatever divided by whatever. And then it's complex conjugate is gonna be one plus whatever divided by whatever. Okay, so if there's an I involved, it's automatically gonna have a complex pair, right? So one fourth minus radical 15 over four I, one fourth plus radical 15 over four I. Okay, so how do you write the factorization? It's gonna look real clumsy, but again, if you stop and think about what we said over here, if my solutions are three and five, you just go X minus that, X minus three, X minus that. Or if X equals negative two, X equals negative four. You go X minus a minus two, X minus a minus four. Okay. Maybe the best way to think about it is I'll cover this up. No matter what's behind my pen, I'm gonna write X minus that. Well, it's three, X minus three. Okay, whatever's behind my pen. Oh, negative two. So it's X minus a negative two. There it is, X plus two. Okay, so follow that same principle here. Okay, I got a pretty weird thing. Okay, this is a solution, right? So by the same logic, I'm gonna go X minus whatever is behind my ruler. X minus that whole thing. So there it goes. X minus parentheses, one fourth minus radical 15 over four I. And likewise, X minus this whole thing, X minus parentheses, one fourth plus radical 15 over four I. I know it looks weird, okay, but it still follows the same principle as all the other ones. Okay, these are the two solutions. So it's X minus that, X minus that. So here we go, X minus one fourth minus radical 15 over four I, X minus parentheses, one fourth plus radical 15 over four I. All right. And you could clean it up if you wanted to, but I don't think you need to, this is good enough. <clears throat> okay, so notice there's always gonna be two solutions in its second degree. We've already seen this, but if it's fourth degree, X to the fourth, there's gonna be four solutions. Okay, and let me show you that now. The so-called fundamental theorem of algebra, page 182, fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, I'll summarize this. If you have X to the nth power, nth degree, you will have exactly N zeros, provided that you count multiplicity. Okay. So if you have X to the seventh, there are gonna be seven zeros if you count the multiplicity, right? Maybe you have X minus one to the fourth power. If you count for multiplicity, there will be exactly however many zeros as the degree of the polynomial is, okay? Which means, and I'll do this starting tomorrow, X to the fourth, there are gonna be four zeros, exactly four, if you allow for multiplicity, okay? If you have X cubed, how many zeros are there gonna be? Exactly three, okay? If you have X to the fifth, there's gonna be five, exactly five. And we're gonna to try to factor anything you know, that has that. Okay, so this one's gonna have exactly three. This one's gonna have exactly four. This one's gonna have three. This one's gonna have five and so on. If you allow for multiplicity. So we're gonna to try to find the zero and also write it in its factored form, okay? All right, but that's as much as I was gonna do right now. Okay, so let me stop the share, check the chat real quickly. And there's a blank chat. Okay, so I'll let you ask any questions now. And if not, we're done for the day, folks. Uh, so tomorrow I'll just keep going. I'll finish up hopefully by Wednesday, uh, Thursday question and answers and the next exam is Friday. Okay, so anybody wanna ask me stuff? Please, otherwise we're done. Okay, I don't hear anything, so we're done today, folks. Okay, so have a good day, and we'll see everybody next time, all right? Okay, bye, everybody.